Uh, I know that some in our audience know the finer points of hockey. The Chris Johnston Show. We are your friends. The biggest stories bringing you inside the game. What did you hear? The Chris Johnston Show. What is going on? Here's Chris with your host, Julian McKenzie. CJ, we have to be like other podcasts and other shows you see on Sports Center or Sports Net Connected or whatever, or whatever sports program that's out there. And we have to offer predictions. I know you don't like them. I don't actually like them either. Like, like why? Like, why do you want to? Like, why I was do you say, want to what a way to set yeah. up this? Like, yeah, keep listening. We both hate what we're doing right now. I mean, that's, that's no. not a good way to sell this pod. That's very fair. But, but we're both fun people. And there's a way to make this fun. So I found a way to generate a whole bunch of different questions that are fun. Some are serious, but some are actually fun. Instead of us just being like, okay, ask us, you know, who's going to win the Stanley Cup or who's going to win the division. We'll get to some of those later. I would hope that with some of the predictions on this predictions episode that we're going to have today, we'll at least be, you know, somewhat entertaining. So we'll get us a laugh or two. We'll get us to, you know, do some shit talking. I don't know. And you're right. Maybe I was a little bit harsh to start off the show. You're right. That's fair. Normally, we're supposed to be positive, upbeat people. I should have been a lot more positive positive and upbeat, Chris. I'm very sorry for that. And most importantly, we're going to give the internet what it wants, which is a chance just to hashtag old takes exposed on us because we're, we're going to throw a whole bunch of things out here. Uh, I'll say full stop. Like, I've done no preparation other than just the general <laughs> preparation for the season and, and an understanding of what's going on around the league. Uh, but, you know, you haven't run these questions by me. I don't know what you're going to come with. I'm sure I'm going to say something that is just profoundly stupid. And, <laughs> you know, as we mentioned last pod, I picked the Calgary Flames preseason last year to win the North Division. And they missed the playoffs. So that that should be your bar of expectation for, you know, don't be going putting money on this. Put it that way. Don't be taking what we say here and and gambling because that's a quick way to get separated from your dollars. Yeah, don't and also don't put any of that into cryptocurrency as well. What a great start. We've mentioned how we, yeah. yeah. Oh, put it into oh, Bitcoin, oh, bud. Put it oh, into okay, Bitcoin. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. I'm I'm dealing with the Bitcoin boss over here, Mr. CJ. Uh before I get started with all the uh, questions I have to throw at CJ, uh just a quick housekeeping note. If you're listening to this podcast on Spotify or Apple or wherever you get podcasts, do us a favor and go watch us on uh, YouTube and subscribe to us there. If you're watching us on YouTube, hey, we're on Spotify, Apple, wherever you get podcasts, go subscribe there. Figure, you know, it's just a good thing to do to get people to subscribe to the CJ show. And with that, we can get her going. So uh, I don't know how many number of questions I have here, but I'm just going to throw them out and you just give me your take. So here's the very first one that I have. Considering the market that you're in, I think this would work very well for yourself and considering my affiliation with the SDP. And now I'm sure I'm going to hear this a lot. Yeah. How many times will we be reminded that the Toronto Maple Leafs regular season doesn't matter? I have the over under on that at like 30. Oh, I'm, I'm hammering the over. I mean, first of all, (laughs) think about it. You got 82 games to be played in the regular season. Um, You know, you got intermission panels and, and pregame shows for those games. I mean, I feel like no matter what the record is, I mean, I guess if they have a really terrible start, then no one will be talking about that because it will be self-evident that things are bad. But I actually think the Leafs are going to have a a good regular season. I don't know what happens after that point. And so I think as it goes along, if they're in first the Atlantic or whatever, it's basically going to be a daily. Yeah, but uh, kind of vibe, you know, at least for the commentators around the team. So to me, 30 is really light. Like it could be 100, honestly, because there's off days. And as you know, um, especially here in the center of the universe, there's a lot of talk about the Leafs. The center of the universe. Uh, people I'm haven't seen it, but I, I know you are, but I still wanted to give the eye roll for our people listening on our respective audio platforms. Yeah, I think going for the over, maybe I thought about 45, but then I thought, I don't know if anyone's going to be able to hear it that much. I mean, how many people are going to go on just watching the Sports Center morning loop over and over and over? Then again, I guess some people still do it. So I guess over could still work here, I, I guess. Or whatever you might say on insider trading as well, too. Uh, yeah, the over is the right one for that. I'm one. personally going to uh, try not to add too much to it. I think it's a little self-evident, fair. but you know, let's face it. Media's job is to, to point out the obvious sometimes. That's fair. Okay, next question for you. Uh, and I think we people should be propping this up a lot more because we're trying to... I would love to see this happen as soon as we can make it happen. 
uh, Alexander Ovechkin chasing the all-time goal-scoring record held by Wayne Gretzky. How many goals does Alexander Ovechkin score this season? I'm going to say 45. Ooh, um, I like that number. You know, I'm I'm very bullish on Alexander Ovechkin, especially after signing that long-term extension in the offseason, uh, reeling in Wayne Gretzky on this record. I mean, when it was like three or four years ago when people first started talking about it, I was thinking like little soon, like as great as he is, you expect as he gets in towards mid thirties and beyond that, that the, the, the rate of, of goals is going to drop off for him, but you know, it really hasn't tailed off that much. And so I, I'm anticipating a healthy season for him. I think that this is a giant carrot um, that's, that's helping propel him, you know, to, to really keep pushing through the late stages of his career. You hear Wayne Gretzky himself say he wants him to beat it. I think it'd be great for the sport to see him chase it down here in these next three or four years. And I think he's going to take a, another big step forward in 2021, 22. Okay. So I'm going to say 36. I mean, he could score more, but I know we're, we're getting into the waning stages of his career and I don't want to overhype it and think, okay, he's going to be a 40, 50 goal scorer every year. That being said, I am happy if he exceeds my expectations and gets like 60 or something, but like there's, I, I don't see Alexander Vetchin scoring 60 at this point in his career. What's interesting is if he gets like 30, which is still obviously a great total for some guys, that's a career season. Then the debate will be like, can he even get there? Like, is this the start of the, the, the drop off? And, you know, I think that's part of what is going to make this pursuit interesting is that it's, it's still not a sure thing as great a goal scorer as he is just because of his age, you know, sometimes father time uh, catches up to you quickly. <sighs> Damn you, Father Time. Anyway, uh, next question. Uh, let's talk about the uh, new $9 million man annually anyway. Kirill Kaprizov, dollar bill Kirill, as I have him. How many goals will Kirill Kaprizov score in the first year of his big money extension? Man, see, what's interesting about him, right, is he, he's got obviously the one pandemic shortened season and he played one division, um, you know, which is not his fault. This is was this, the season that was given to him, but um, you know, the league's still going to be getting to know this guy to a certain degree. You know, I don't see a huge fall off there. He scored, I know points wise, he was a little under a point a game, 0.93, I believe he was. Uh, I'll go for, I'll give him 30 goals, uh, which I realize is still a bit high, but you know, I, I, I don't get the sense that this is a guy that's going to be too scared off by the contract or putting too much external pressure on himself. He's performed great in Russia for many years. And I think now the whole league will get to see him, which is one of the cool things about going back to a more regular uh, schedule. Oh, man, I have him at 31. And I think this is the year where everyone realizes how exciting Kirill Kaprizov is. He showed off some amazing things in the condensed schedule last year, just playing in one division. And everyone's thinking, well, damn, like Kirill Kaprizov's in Minnesota, you know, in the U.S. Midwest. Now he's going to be able to play against teams all across the, the National Hockey League landscape. This is the year everyone realizes how dope of a player Kirill Kaprizov is. Like the future of the game is pretty cool. I mean, between him and Kale McCarr and Adam Fox and all these other exciting young players, like I'm really excited for like the next like 10, 15 years and the talent that we're going to be seeing uh, to come. And Kirill Kaprizov right at the forefront. And with respect to Marion Gabrick, for my money, the best player in Minnesota Wild history or the most exciting, electrifying. I can't and think I know, of, and he's yeah. played fifty-five games or whatever total. But I, I think that it's fair to have that conversation with him. I I think so too. I I mean, no disrespect to Marion Gabbert, but like he was a good, he was a great player for them. But I don't remember, and maybe it's because of the way the internet was and how we consume games now. But there was not the same amount of attention on Kirill Kaprizov compared to what Marion Gabbert got in Minnesota. And that's so why I'm, I'm, that's why Kaprizov got a contract basically no one's ever got before, right? Is because. Ultimately, yes, it's not a perfect deal. Nine million on a five-year deal, you know, for the wild. But I think it's just a recognition that he has a lot of marketing value. He's brought excitement to their fan base. They, they just couldn't let him go. They, they had to lock him up as long as they possibly could. Next question. It's the third consecutive question where we discuss a Russian player, mm -hmm. uh, Evgeny Malkin. I love it too. Uh, I believe he is injured to start off the year, but he's also a pending unrestricted free agent. What team? Will Evgeny Malkin end this season with? Will it be with the Penguins or will it be with someone else? Cheeky question, Julian. I, I like where your mind's at here, though. I'm going to say Pittsburgh, but the fact that there even has to be like a small amount of thought about it kind of hints at what I think will be one of the stories this year. I think kind of, I don't know what to call it the end of the Penguins as we've known them is upon us a little bit. You know, Malkin and Chris Letang are 
unrestricted free agents, you know, obviously getting older. I don't think Malkin's going to be healthy to play until January, uh, based on what I've been told. So it's, you know, it's another half season without him. You know, I don't see them trading him. He holds a no move clause. I think he loves Pittsburgh and, and, you know, all things being equal, I'm sure he'd like to finish his career penguin, but you know, where he starts next year is, is a bit of an open question. I think he ends this year as a penguin, but it'll be, you know, fascinating to watch how they approach those UFA situations. Cause at some point they're going to have to rebuild. I, I just don't know if they'll officially kick that off in these next few months, or if they'll try to kick the ball down the road another couple of years. Am I wrong in saying that, you know, even if, you know, one Malkin has the NMC, but the two people in Pittsburgh who I would think kind of hold the key to his future are Sidney Crosby and Mario Lemieux, like not even the GM. Like, I, I think it's just down to those two people who ultimately decide whether or not we run it back with Evgeny Malkin again, or we just say, you know what, let's tear this all down and start over. Am I wrong on that assessment? No, I I think that's very correct way to look at it. And, and you know, really to me, it's what number 87 wants. I mean, how, do, how does he want his last few years in the NHL to play out? And I don't know how long he's got left. I know he's got a few more years under contract, um, but you know, it might be tough for him if, if he sees some good friends in Malkin and, and Latang, you know, allowed to walk away or if they are traded or whoever it plays out, you know, I, I do think that, you know, they have to look at that and, and, you know, where Mary Lemieux comes in is there's a marketing end of this and, and, you know, in Pittsburgh, they've had an unbelievable run 15 straight years in the playoffs, the, the three Stanley cups, they won been close a number of other times. I mean, it's all you could ask for, for a core of a team, but, you know, I think they have to think about their fans uh, their sponsors, all those types of things. And so it's, it, it is a, a complicated decision. And then the other one we shouldn't overlook here, Julian, is, you know, Malkin's coming off a pretty serious knee injury here. You know, yeah. what version of him comes back? Is he able to play at a level that he wants to keep playing for years and years and years? Because, you know, he's at a point certainly where he doesn't have to. Uh, his family's well taken care of. He's, you know, accomplished amazing things in the sport. And so, you know, I think part of this will be seeing what level he comes back and performs at to see how much longer he wants to to keep playing in the NHL. A lot of questions surrounding Evgeny Malkin in the future of the Pittsburgh Penguins, a team that, as far as I'm concerned, as long as Malkin is healthy, Crosby is healthy, they have a chance at the Stanley Cup every single year. So, yeah, a lot of questions and, and some tidbits coming out of this, too. You thought we were just going to be talking about predictions and just sounding stupid. No, there's some insight here from Chris Johnston. We always try to keep you informed. Um, next question. Even while uh, making wildly wrong predictions for an entire wow. episode. I don't think they're going to be wildly wrong. I think we'll hit on something. There's going to be like at least like one that we're going to hit on super hard. And like, we're just going to prop that up for like the rest of the history of this show. We're going to be like, hey, remember when we got this one, right? There's going to be at least one. I know and we're going to need, need our man, Jesse Blake, to delete everything else. Like the other 28 <laughs> minutes of nonsense that, that doesn't hold up so well. Like, let's scrub that of the Internet as soon as we can. I never said Alexander Ovechkin was going to score 36 goals in a season. What are you talking about? I get that. We'll, we'll get Jesse on that. Um, the least expected player to be named to Team Canada's final roster in Beijing. I understand there is the 53 or 55 man roster that Canada is allowed to name, I believe, next week, the 15th, two days after the, uh, the regular season starts. But the least expected player to be named to Team Canada's final roster in Beijing. So the way I look through this, I, I don't think it can be a forward because there's there's probably like nine forwards everyone thinks should be on Team Canada and, there's, and only six of those guys there's going to be room for. Like there's not necessarily going to be room for all of Matthew Barzell and Mark Shifley and Mark Stone and Jonathan Huberdeau and Sean Couturier. You know, like the point is, is if I said one of those guys, like I think most people would be like, yeah, they should be on the team. So to me, it's either going to be the least likely or maybe the name that doesn't get the most hype is either going to be a surprise defenseman, which I think is possible because this, this group's turning over, right? I mean, um, you know, Duncan Keith and Drew Doughty were kind of the, the long-term, like, like the last number of years for international competition, they were mainstays, you know, certainly in Keith's case, I don't expect them to be there. We'll see if Doughty can get back. You know, there's some turnover there. And then the goaltending bit of a question mark. So I'm going to go, a little out of left field since you want the okay. least likely name. Yeah. I'm going to say Adam Pellick. Mm. Because I don't so, see, okay. I don't see him right. getting a lot of love. Um, like in these lists that get put together, I'm still admitting as we're recording this at the start of October, before the next season has started, he, he's far from a lock to make this team, but based on the last two playoffs with the Islanders, I think he's caught the eyes of management. 
And I think that there's a world where he can at least find himself on the roster. Maybe it's the eighth D man. Maybe he's not playing every game. Um, and since you're asking for the least likely name or the one that's not being talked about, I'm going to, I'm going to settle on Pellick. Okay. Um, mine, and you can disagree and say that enough people have been talking about this guy, but just off of what I've seen, uh, I think Darcy Kemper deserves a lot more love. I Ooh. think the fact that he's in Colorado and he's going to be playing on a better team might help him out a little bit, but I think he's also a pretty decent goaltender. And whenever I've heard people talk about what Team Canada's goaltending situation will look like, Carey Price is like the de facto number one, even though he is not going to start the season. I mean, we still have to kind of figure out, you know, when he'll actually be back with the Montreal Canadiens, but a lot of people are penciling him in in the goaltending stable. And after that, there are some questions, but I've seen Marc-Andre Fleury's name be thrown out there. Carter Hart, a lot of people are expecting him to bounce back and be available. Uh, Jordan Bennington out in St. Louis could at least be a number three. I think Darcy Kemper should be in in those conversations. Mackenzie Blackwood has also been mentioned as well. Who knows what his status is going to be? But I like like Kemper. That's a good name. That's that's a that was one I hadn't really thought of, but I think it makes a lot of sense. Especially if he has a good first, you know, part of the season, that's going to be part of what makes these decisions for Doug Armstrong and his and his staff. Exactly. So yeah, we have different names for least expected. Let's see uh, if both of those guys make Team Canada uh, come in February. Uh, one of the matchups, I believe, to start off the NHL season, and if memory serves, I think NHL and TNT they they prop this up as well. And I mean, not going to lie, I kind of want to watch this too. It's the Washington Capitals and the New York Rangers. We know about the bad blood between both of those teams, especially because of one Tom Wilson. We saw how the Rangers beefed themselves up. Uh, Ryan Reeves, I think, got injured in a preseason contest. So, I mean, I don't know when he'll be back, but you're, I would expect Ryan Reeves should be around to throw fisticuffs uh, with the <laughs> oh, geez, with the Washington Capitals. How many penalty minutes are we going to see between both teams in their very first matchup of the year. I have to think the Rangers are going to go into a game against the Capitals looking to start a fight. I know we have our the views on fighting are a little bit skewed, but like I I, I don't know. I don't think you have an offseason like the Rangers did and you don't want to come out for blood against the guy who basically wrecked your team. Yes. So I think that there will be a fight, but I'm not sure that there's going to be many fights. Um, and so I'm going to take a smaller number. I'm going to say like 30 penalty minutes. Like, I don't think it's going to be one one of these, you know, I saw Florida and and Tampa had like a hundred penalty plus penalty minute game in the preseason, you know, with some of what's left over from their playoff series. I think sometimes when there's a lot of focus on these, these games, you know, like the, the revenge kind of scenario, whatever you want to frame it as, I think sometimes it doesn't really manifest itself. And so I would be shocked if there isn't a fight. But then I, I think it'll be done with. I don't think it'll be like five fights in the first period or anything like that. Uh, well, some people for entertainment's sake might have wanted the five fights in the first period. Hey, it might still happen. Look, I'm, I'm it just, could. I, I, I've just seen it so often where when everyone hypes it up, it usually kind of fizzles for whatever reason. Yeah, that's true. So I'm I'm with you on that. I don't think you're too far off in in kind of downplaying the number. Are you accounting for for that number? Are you accounting for like other minor penalty minutes throughout the game as well? Yes. Yeah. And like the possibility there's a 10 minute misconduct is what I'm thinking. There could be an instigator or something tacked onto um that that fight. That's why I I, I hedged it by going up to 30. I mean, really, I'm thinking more like 20. I'm thinking just almost like a normal game with one fight. Yeah. Like I, like it could easily be like just off the hop, get it out the way, and then just go play hockey for the rest of it. Because at the end of the day, I kind of want to actually watch a hockey game and not watch the start, stop, start, stop, start, stop of fighting like we saw in that late regular season game. I like 30. Uh, I, I, I'll i agree with you with 30. I'll, I'll side with you with that number. I don't think it's going to be that much. And Reeves and Wilson have a history. Remember, they got into it back in the day. So this is, uh, you know, just because that's what game one holds doesn't mean, look, they'll play each other a few more times in regular season. Nick. It, it could amplify throughout that. Next question here. Uh, the Washington Capitals got ahead of the game with uh, announcing their sponsor for their jersey patches. I think it's a sports book, if I recall correctly. Mm-hmm. I was just curious. Uh, I'm sure there are going to be like, you know, obviously they're going to hear more and more of these deals come out with all these different teams. But I am positive there's going to be some ridiculous company name or just some weird company that's going to come in. Give me the most ridiculous jersey patch sponsor partnership to be announced. Like, what if, like, the SDPN locked in some deal with the Toronto Maple Leafs or something? 
that would be awesome. Uh, That'd be hilarious. It, you know, I don't know if they if they got that kind of dough to be throwing that around, but you know, why not? If you you can speak it into existence, maybe. Uh, I think it's going to be Chipotle. <laughs> I think we're going to see Chipotle on someone's sweater. Whose sweater? That one I don't know. Like maybe like Arizona or you know one of the you know some of these teams. Like there's, there's different marketing values on these teams. So I don't think you're going to see Chipotle on an original six sweater, but. I think some of the newer teams to the league have a little bit more ability to to be creative there. That's fair. Money uh, talks, like, man. That's true. Like the Boston Bruins are probably going to walk around with like Dunkin' Donuts logos on their sweaters. They probably will. Dunkin' Donuts is a huge Bruin sponsor already. And I mean, maybe that's ridiculous. I mean, this, look at this is we this is the world we live in, right? I mean, I, I, I think anything's possible. There'll probably be something even more ridiculous than Chipotle. I just can't even give you a good answer what it might be. I think Chipotle is pretty ridiculous. Like, I think that's pretty funny enough as it is. Cause like, you could have like serious ones, like, I don't know, like uh good year tires or some other cup or Kumo or, or banks, whatever. You know what I mean? Like big financial yeah. companies, like those are sort of obvious. Uh, those are the kind of ones or big telecom companies in Canada. Like the, basically the, the, the companies that sponsor buildings already um, are kind of the obvious ones. And I think that's probably where most of the Canadian logos will end up with, but, I think in the U.S. you'll see a little bit more creative uh, liberties taken with these these sponsorships. I know in uh, in Quebec with the Canadians, their AHL affiliate, if I recall correctly. Uh, oh yeah, Saint Hubert chicken, Saint Hubert, which I think is overrated personally. Like I don't see the big deal about Saint Hubert chicken. It's just dry chicken. But hey, maybe they upgrade themselves to the Montreal Canadiens. Uh, this whenever they uh, announce they are going to have that partnership on their jerseys. Like, I, I don't know why people are so hyped about St. Hubert chicken. Like, I, there are a f- far better chicken places you can go to, but people in Quebec love St. Hubert chicken. I love it too, man. I used to go to that one really beside right the Bell Center. Every time I was there to cover a game, I'd go there after the morning skate. So, you know, part of it was ritual, part of it's novelty. Like, we don't have them here in Ontario where I live. Um, I'm not going to go to the wall for St. Hubert chicken and argue it's no. the greatest thing ever, <laughs> but, but I, I certainly can appreciate a, a good St. Hubert uh, meal. Okay. So like when you eventually like, you know, make your way to Montreal, we meet up over there, uh, chalet barbecue. Uh, I think it's not even like a big chain place that I think if you want like, you know, chicken from a restaurant or whatever, I think that's like probably the best place you could probably go to as far as I'm concerned. But like on the low, just like come through and I'll ask my mom and we'll we'll get some chicken whipped up. Like, all right. Like, it, it's no big deal. Like, chalet barbecue is real cool, but like, it's not beating my mom's cooking. OK, anyway. <laughs> well, that was never on offer when I was covering morning skates in the past. So I had to settle I mean, for St. Hubert. I mean, like, look, we didn't even know we were doing this podcast until recently. So, you know, I, I get that. Hey, it's Julian here. Just want to let you all know about something pretty cool from officepools.com. They've got a hockey pool running where if you participate, you might put yourself in a position where you could win some pretty cool prizes. Officepools.com, just in case you haven't ever heard of them, was launched in 1995. They were the first website that allowed people to manage a hockey pool online instead of waiting for the scores to be posted on the bulletin board or fridge the very next day. And now they serve hundreds of thousands of users and are the premier fantasy hockey site in Canada. Whether you want to create a box pool, which is pretty easy to set up or great for fundraising, or if you have a lot of people who want to participate, an open pool or a draft pool, Office Pools has the perfect format for your hockey pool needs. So if you go to officepools.com, join the athletic hockey pool, which is powered by all of the athletic hockey shows and they're giving you a chance to participate and and have a chance at winning some pretty cool prizes uh, you could win potentially some signed jerseys from some players like Sidney crosby uh john Tavares is also in that list as well uh you could also have a chance at winning a ps5 as well as an xbox series x there's a lot of cool prizes i haven't even mentioned so go to officepools.com join the athletic hockey pool and sign up and make your picks to give yourself a chance at winning some fantastic prizes. It's September, which means football season is back. And for many of us, there's no better way to celebrate and enjoy the games than by having some skin in the game, which is why BetMGM remains the exclusive betting partner of The Athletic. 
And as a fan of The Athletic, you can bet $10 to win 150 plus a free three-month subscription or extension to your subscription with The Athletic when you bet with BetMGM using our promo code. Just sign up at BetMGM.com and use the promo code THEATHLETICPOD at checkout to take advantage of this special offer from the king of sportsbooks. That's bet $10 to win $150 plus three months free from The Athletic at betmgm.com using the promo code the athletic pod the athletic pod is all in one word at checkout new customer offer visit betmgm.com for terms and conditions 21 years of age or older to wager arizona colorado washington dc indiana iowa michigan new jersey nevada pennsylvania tennessee virginia and west virginia only excludes michigan disassociated persons please gamble responsibly gambling problem call 1-800 next step in arizona 1-800-522-4700 in colorado washington dc nevada wyoming and virginia 1-800-270-7117 for confidential help in michigan 1-800 gambler in maryland new jersey pennsylvania and west virginia 1-800 bets off in iowa call or text the tennessee red line 800-889-9789 in tennessee or call 1-800-9 with it in indiana um the next question i have as we roll through all these different questions this is really fun for me i, I hope you're having fun as well uh ucj and everyone else listening or watching on the various platforms that you're on uh what's the longest losing streak we'll see this year and which team will suffer through it who i think buffalo is a good bet yeah I'm, i mean i would go buffalo or detroit i'm gonna say buffalo and how long well, they had it last year, right? I mean, how long was that losing streak last year? 15 games? 12 yeah, games? Yeah, it was, it was like the longest one in like quite some time. Like I beat, I think the, the Pittsburgh Penguins I'm, had like I'm gonna say, previous I'm gonna longest say one. 10 games, and I'm going to say the Sabres. Um, you know, they got a tough roster. They got a tough situation with Jack Eichel. I don't think there's any mystery about what's going on there. I, I see them probably, you know, the, the trouble is when you lose as much as they've lost in past seasons, I think it can be hard to pull out of it too. Like it, that there's got to be a feeling, especially for players that have been around, like, here we go again. Um, like, there's a psychological aspect to it. And so, unfortunately for Sabres, I, that's that's who I'm guessing. On the subject of Jack Eichel, uh, we all know about his situation going on. What team does Jack Eichel end the season on? I'm going to say the Buffalo Sabres. Uh, really? And, and this- you don't think he gets traded? I think he gets traded, but I don't see it till next off season. And look, oh. I hope I'm wrong. Like, look, we, we, we've heard this week, you know, there's, there's some interest picking up, you know, I think that Jack Eichel's agents from CAA are doing what they can to educate teams on his medical situation. You know, he's got a lot of independent MRIs done, um, you know, trying to get teams comfortable with the idea of trading for him. But, you know, my sense of the market is that for sure, there's teams out there that want Jack Eichel, that like Jack Eichel. I think that's self-evident, but you know, I'm not sure that there's that many teams willing to step up and pay the kind of price a the Sabers are looking for, and and the timing to me doesn't make a whole lot of sense because depending on which surgical procedure he gets done, you know, you're basically at this point you you can't really count on him being much of a contributor during this season, and so I don't think there'll be urgency in this situation until we get through the year. You know, I hope I'm wrong. I think first and foremost, the most important thing is that that Jack's able to to get treated to get the surgery to you know, ease the discomfort he's, he's got going and to, to, you know, start having a goal towards working his way back. But, you know, I don't think he's getting that surgery until there's a trade and I'm not sure a trade's going to emerge that makes sense for Buffalo until after the year. So I, I, I see this being a May or June trade. He does have that, you know, trade clause kicking in July 1st. So it, it has to get done before then. In my view, I think they're really hamstrung if they get into next July, but I, I, I actually made some calls this week on an Eichel story and, there is a lot of people around the league that think it's going to be hard to see this done during the season. Yeah. I, I hope guess I'm wrong. I hope this is an old takes exposed and he's traded October 12th and I look like an idiot, <laughs> but um, I just don't sense that the market's there for him yet. Well, I mean, I, I can't, I, I can't understand why you would be looked at as an idiot because of the fact that, you know, we're not talking about a guy who's dealing with like a groin pole or a hamstring. We're not about a guy with a neck injury. Like that's, that's really serious here. Like that's, and he's trying to get this proper surgery for it. Like I, I can understand why some teams might have pause on acquiring a player like that. I still thought that there was a chance for him to be dealt with in the off season. And then you go through all of that and then you enter the regular season and, and at least some of that recovery time has gone through. 
But yeah, I, I completely understand why some teams would have pause on this uh, with Jack Eichel. But uh, okay, I like the idea of you saying that he'll get dealt with in the offseason. I still, I'm still holding out hope. I don't know how many teams are interested in Jack Eichel, but like I'm holding out hope that like someone picks up the phone and says, we want Jack Eichel. And he'll probably come at a reduced price because of the fact that he has the injury that he has to deal with. He has to go through the recovery and it won't cost nearly as much as it was supposed to before. No. Yeah. They've, the, in my opinion, the best deal would have been on the table late July last year prior to the entry draft. And then after that, it gets harder and harder to trade him. Again, the teams that like him are all sort of saying quietly, yeah, we like him, but at a reduced rate. And, you know, I, I think it's a tough spot for Kevin Adams to be in. Uh, I mean, this is just an unfortunate situation for everyone. I, I, I think we're at the point where no one's winning from this going on and on, but I, I don't see an immediate end here. And I should mention, to interrupt you, Julian, just because my Go phone's going bananas. Go uh, ahead. Breaking news, big news in the hockey world and, and unfortunate news too, but uh, Carey Price has stepped away from the Canadians. He's entering the NHL and HLPA player assistance program. So um, whoa, the whoa, terms of that whoa, whoa, whoa. Are, are never made public unless a player makes it public. It could be a variety of issues, but uh, let's hope Carey gets whatever help he needs. And, you know, who knows you know, the, the way that works too is there's no, you know, there's no defined time. It's, it's um, you know, it's, it's hard to say, how long will be gone? I, I don't know what he's dealing with, but we, we wish him the best. Yes, I, we wish him the best, of course. is I mean, it, it, this is very much breaking for all of us. I'm sure by the time you all hear this, you'll know more details that have come out. Uh, but yeah, wow, that is very surprising. I, I always thought about the fact that maybe there would be an episode where breaking news would come in. Uh, I didn't expect it to happen on episode five of the show, but uh, you were able to kind of list off everything that I guess that we know so far about Carey Price. But that is a huge huge bit of news for the Montreal Canadiens, a team that we already mentioned at the beginning of this episode that, you know, Carey Price is not going to be available to them to the start of the season. And now for the foreseeable future, it doesn't look as if he's going to be available to them at all. And this is a team that was already going to be without Shea Weber uh, pretty much probably forever at this rate with the amount of injuries. Paul Byron also gone until January. Mike Hoffman hasn't skated during training camp. This is a team that might go off on a pretty wonky start because of the fact that they have all these guys unavailable to them, not to make Carey Price, you know, the, the focus of these last few minutes, but this is obviously breaking news to us. Well, and it fills in some of the details on their decision to claim Samuel Montembeau off waivers from Florida earlier in the week, which, you know, obviously in this case, it's a goaltender they like. He's young, uh, you know, makes sense to give him a shot. But, you know, you wondered how long do they need a third goaltender for? Well, he's probably in our number two goaltender behind Jake Allen. You know, I don't want to speculate, but for, for a period of time here, um, usually these aren't short stays for players when, when they enter this type of program, at least historically. And so, you know, it's, it's going to be, a, it was going to be a tough season, I think anyway, for Montreal coming off the cup final, but having so much upheaval and, you know, this is, uh, you know, got some big implications for them. And, you know, as I say, most importantly, let's hope Kerry gets the help he needs. Absolutely. Um, I still have a few other uh, questions. If you'd like for me to keep these coming, uh, I one of them does include uh, which how many Canadian teams will make the playoffs. I thought the Canadians would be one of them, but I'm very curious about how that is now with the light of the recent news. I wanted to ask about the Arizona Coyotes and uh, the lease that they have at the uh, Gila River Arena, which is supposed to expire at the end of the year. And a lot of people were drumming up, were drumming up speculation about where they could be playing next year. Uh, where do you think the Coyotes are going to play at the end of next season? It's going to be in Arizona. I'm reasonably confident of that. I, I don't see this team being relocated, but it's very much up in the air. And, and, you know, obviously just given that state, there's not an endless amount of places they can do it. There's not that many arenas or, or ice surfaces, especially those with enough stands to sell tickets for. Um, but, you know, I, I, I don't think the NHL's reached the end of wanting to work things out and they, they still believe that in the right circumstances, the Coyotes can be a successful team. It is a huge market. You know, Glendale has been a bit of an unmitigated disaster, I think, for the organization. It's just anyone who's been there, it's so far from where a lot of their fan base is, is located closer to Scottsdale. The traffic can be bad. You know, they're not set up for success where they are now. So, you know, I, I think after this divorce, um, they remain in Arizona, but I, I don't, I can't tell you where they're playing yet. I just, I don't know. I'd be guessing. That's fine. That's okay. We're, we're allowed to say that we don't know. We would be right. lying if but we just But my point had, is I'm yeah. not saying it's Kansas City or, or Quebec City or Houston or any of the other places that might have been speculated. Elsewhere. That's fine. I think that's fine too. And I'm sure the NHL would probably not want it to see it like, you know, move to 
or maybe it's weird to say they wouldn't want to see it move if it doesn't work. But I mean, the, the fact that it's been in Arizona as long as it has, I would imagine the league has some vested interest in making professional hockey work in that state. Well, and they believe it can work and will work with the right arena situation. Now, I guess the question is, how long can you wait for that right arena situation to emerge? I mean, the Coyotes have been part of multiple projects where they hope to get an arena built that didn't you know, go through for one reason or another. You know, how long can they remain patient, I think is a fair question. But for me, it's going to be beyond this next year. I, th- I think that um, they'll, they'll find a temporary solution and, and try to get that arena built. And maybe if for whatever reason that doesn't manifest itself, then the relocation talks a little more real. This next question is a little bit more fun. Uh, mm-hmm. I think of Snoop Dogg, who did this with the uh, Los Angeles Kings a few years ago, hopping into their broadcast booth and calling a game, I believe was with them and the Pittsburgh Penguins. Which celebrity do you think we'll see join a broadcast, whether in Canada or in the United States, and call a hockey game? Wow. Maybe Will Arnett. I think. Oh, uh, that's good. That's good. He, vo- he voiced up that Amazon series, and and he seems to be getting a little closer to the Leafs. I could see Justin Bieber, honestly, too. I mean, I I think you know that the Raptors kind of have that global ambassador thing with Drake, and we've seen partnerships there. He's designed jerseys for them. OVO is on their their practice uh, center in Toronto, and and it seems like Bieber is getting a bit more of a relationship with with the Leafs. So I I could see it being one of those two. Um, that's, it's a question out of left field, but I do think that hockey's embracing a bit more of the the, the cross branding uh, opportunities. So I started with Will Arnett, though. I'm going to end on Bieber. I think we, we see Bieber doing a lot more with the Leafs this season. That's really cool. Uh, I was going to say, uh, and maybe some people who watch the show know who they are. I'm a big fan of them. Uh, the comedian duo Jesus and Merrill, they're big uh, New York sports fans. Yeah. Uh, I would like to see like the Rangers pick them up and say, hey, you know what? Like, call this game between like the Rangers and Caps or something. And you know, even if like the NHL network picks up on them, they, I know they've done it for major league baseball stuff. So I think it's just a natural thing for them to do. So I'll say Jesus and Mero, uh, Michael Buble. I know he's been in part of a part of Canucks broadcast as well. So maybe he's probably the more likely person, but I'll, maybe I'll we'll get a Manning and cast in, in hockey too. Maybe some former players will come out and we'll have like alternate broadcasts. I mean, I, I think the possibilities are endless. I've enjoyed those Manning casts a little bit uh, tuning in on Monday nights. I just want to say this. I'm just going to throw this out there. And I know some people might say that it might be biased considering who is in charge, whose name is on the network here. Why is there no alternate cast with Steve Dangle and just random like celebrities and other people hopping in? Steve Dangle had a whole postseason where it's like watch a game with a Leafs fan and hundreds of thousands of people tuned in. Like at this point in Canada to watch hockey, we like that should be a thing to have an alternate cast and like Steve Dangle, like should be the perfect person to, to lead that. And again, people are going to be like, Oh, you're biased. But like, I, I think it would work. I don't want to break too much news here, Julian, but that's the thing that's definitely going to happen this season. <laughs> we shouldn't go on though. <laughs> okay. I've said, I've said too much. Okay. Uh, to the next question. Um, who's the biggest name to look out for ahead of the NHL trade deadline? What a jump. <laughs> well, since I've already said that Evgeny Malkin's not getting traded, uh, I think it'll be Thomas Hurdle. And, you know, let's be real about what the NHL trade deadline is now, right? It's a lot of depth defensemen and depth forwards that get traded, and usually one or two more marquee players. You know, what Hurdle is at this point in his career, he's 27. He's a top line center for the San Jose Sharks, maybe a second line center for a team with higher ambitions. It's not really the type of player that moves too often. Like Taylor Hall moved a couple of years ago, uh, was ended up being in December, so a fair bit before the deadline, but he was going to be a deadline day deal if they didn't complete that transaction earlier when he got traded from New Jersey to Arizona. Um, you know, I, I think Hurdle's the most likely name. You know, some of the other UFAs that are out there or pending UFAs is like Morgan Riley. You got John Klingberg in Dallas, but I just think teams like the Leafs and the Stars. Are, are going to be competitive this year and probably won't be, you know, shedding those contracts, you know, come deadline time. Okay. Next one. Uh, if Connor McDavid doesn't win the scoring title, who does? I got to go with Nathan McKinnon. Um, yeah. You know, he, look, he's been all around it and it's funny. He, he spent some time working out in Toronto in the summers nowadays. And like the word on the street about this guy is legendary. Like the, the workouts he's doing, how focused and committed he is. You know, I think certainly becoming as close as he has to Sidney Crosby has rubbed off on him a little bit. I just, 
it's hard to identify an individual that is that elite that that would seem to want it more. And I'm not calling anyone else into question in terms of their desire. I just think that he's next level in terms of ability and and wanting to get this thing done. And you know, if I had to put my house on it, of course, I'm saying Connor McDavid's winning the scoring title. Um, but if it has to be someone else, I think Nathan McKinnon is is the most likely. Boom or bust season for for the Colorado Avalanche, as far as I'm concerned. And it wouldn't surprise me if in the midst of all of that, that results in probably the greatest season we've seen from Nathan McKinnon. Um, this Maybe one, he'll bring his boy Darcy Kemper to the Olympic team with him, too. That's totally possible as well. <laughs> and they could celebrate if they win the Stanley Cup by going to California and eating a bunch of In-N-Out burgers. Because as I've understood, Nathan McKinnon likes a burger every now and then. He's not just someone who just eats nothing but you know healthy food. I right. think gluten free pasta or whatever. Yeah, whatever. Um, Brady Kachuk, I, like, I feel like we've brought him up like so many times on this podcast. He still remains unsigned as a restricted free agent. How many games do the Senators play before they sign Brady Kachuk? Oh, this is a good question because let's face it, <laughs> as of right now, I've got no reason to believe there's been progress there. Like, it sounds like the sides are pretty dug in. And wow. we're talking, you know, the Senators' first game of the season is next Thursday, a week today from when we're recording this. You know, it, it's looking very possible that he's going to miss a game or games. But I will say, I'm going to go with zero, which is maybe a boring answer, but this is why. Is that as bad as any negotiation looks, one thing I've learned in, in covering a number of these over the years is that the sides recognize a real deadline. And to me, the start of the regular season is a real deadline. Like sometime between now and next Thursday, each side has to put its a better offer or its best offer on the table um, that then that hasn't been there currently in their negotiations. And I just, you know, I really don't see a scenario where going into the season without Kachuk sign makes any sense for Ottawa. So I believe, even though as we're recording this, I don't believe anything's going on. It's just hard not to think that they'll find a way to get it done and get him playing game one. You know, I, like Brady's a young guy. I know he was in Ann Arbor training with Elias Pedersen and, and Quinn Hughes. You know, it would have been better to be in camp than than doing those skates. But, you know, I think that they'll be comfortable throwing them basically right into a game. And I bet he signs sometime early next week. I mean, at this point, considering how news was breaking on our show already, wouldn't surprise me if before we end up before we end our recording today, if Brady Kachuk ends up being announced uh, with a new deal with the Ottawa Senators. Um, the Seattle Kraken is the next question I want to next team I want to discuss. I don't think we've brought them up at all to this point. In the division that they're in, which some people have seen as the weakest of all the four divisions in the NHL. I'm in that camp. Are they, are they good enough to make the playoffs? How many points do you think they'll get? You don't have to add points if it's too hard, but will they make the playoffs? I'm going to say yes, and I'm giving them 96 points, which will probably be somewhere right around the line of the playoffs. Like I, you know, I think it's going to be touch and go, but I, I think they're good enough watch some of their preseason. They're getting organized. Um, yeah, I think they're going to be a, a tough team this year. And I, they're just deep. And so not huge high-end skill at this point or like game-breaker type players on that team. But I think they're, they're going to be a pain in the butt to play against and win a lot of 2-1 type of games. And that's not, a, that's not a bad problem to have, to be a team that's just tough to play against. It's Vegas' division to lose. But if you're Seattle and you're able to win some of these games with a high compete level, you're putting yourself in the right direction, I think. Exactly. Okay. Uh, how many Canadian teams make the postseason this year? I'm going with four. Uh, I see the Leafs getting in in the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. I see the Jets getting in. And then in the Pacific, I think Edmonton's in and one of Calgary or Vancouver, which is hedging my bets a little bit. I just, I don't see both of those teams getting in, but I think one of Calgary, Vancouver, and then Edmonton, Winnipeg, and Toronto. So I believe it'll be four. Okay. Um, Montreal actually, and Ottawa oh, skating uphill right now. Yeah, especially considering the news with Carey Price. Uh, it could very well be a situation where, you know, Ottawa, Montreal misses the playoffs. That really changes my view of this team because pretty much all week I've been saying that they're a team that's going to fight for a wild card spot. And if Carey Price is out for the foreseeable future, I know we don't have an exact timeline on when he'll be back. But if he's gone more than like the first half of the season, the most important thing I should I should stress this. The most important thing is that he gets the help that he needs and that yeah. he's able to come away from this and, you know, be you know a good person, function member of society, whatever have you. I don't have any intel of what's going on. And at the end of the day, like, you know, while we are in the business of speculating and talking hockey and whatever, 
we're talking about real human beings here, and that's what really matters when it comes to Carey Price. So I hope sincerely he gets whatever help that he needs, regardless of whatever it does for being with the team. But to, to, just, to quote, just to end my point, I'll just say that, you know, with him being gone and we don't know how much time he'll, we will be gone, foreseeably, I would imagine it would take quite a bit of time. I think it definitely does uh, take a hit. The Montreal Kings definitely do take a hit to their playoff hopes. Yeah, just at least Jake clarify. Allen's a good a good insurance yes. option there, though. I mean, go back a couple of years, they, they always had trouble with the second goalie behind Price. I think that this shows the wisdom in trading for and extending Allen as they did uh, you know, a year or so ago. Two last ones for you, CJ. Name your division winners for the Pacific, the Central, the Atlantic, and the Metropolitan. I'm not going to go too far off the board. Fine. Um, I think Pacific, I'm going to go Vegas. Central, I'm going to go Colorado. Atlantic, I'm going to go Toronto. I think Tampa is a better team on paper, but I just think you can't ignore the fact they won two cups literally in like an 11 month span, two yes. short off seasons, and lost an entire line. Um, I still think they're very good. I, 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 you know, certainly see them as a playoff team and could see them going for a three peat, but I think the regular season might be a bit of a slog for a team that's played as much as it has. Um, and then the Metro is a tougher call, if, if we're being honest. Uh, you know, I see it slide back for Pittsburgh. Who, who do I want to pick here? I think the Devils are going to be a surprising team. I'm not picking them to win the Metro, but I, I see them getting into the playoffs. I'm going to go with Philadelphia, mm. um, which is a little off the board. Obviously, last season was a bit of a disaster there. Uh, they've they made some some changes. Ryan Ellis coming in on their blue line. Uh, you know, got Cam Atkinson, traded Voracek out, you know, changed kind of the feel around their team. I think Carter Hart has a better year. And I still think that's a pretty deep team. So I, I think Philadelphia is going to have a big bounce back and win the Metro this season. Is it not far-fetched to say the Islanders could win that division? Like, I know the Islanders are really good and some they're kind of boring in some respects, but like they've been in the conference final, like back-to-back years. They've gone up against Tampa Bay and given them everything that they have, I, I mean, they don't need to win the division to make the playoffs, obviously. But like, I, why not have them win the division? I, they actually haven't had great regular seasons the last two years. That they they certainly had, like, they're built for the playoffs, and I think their identity clearly works for them. I'm not down on the Islanders. Uh, I just think in in the regular season games, the way they're played is a little differently. I don't think they're they're set up for as much regular season success, where you just see random teams all over the place. You're playing back to back, all that stuff. But I, I certainly think that's a team no one wants to play in the playoffs. And, and I wouldn't be surprised to see them have a third straight uh, great postseason run. I just don't see them getting the most points in the regular season. CJ, one last question for you. Stanley Cup final matchup and who wins? I'm going, going with Colorado. Uh, yes. I feel like it's their time. I don't think they were that far off last year. I mean, really, Colorado and Vegas probably are the, the two betting favorites. I, I haven't didn't look at the lines, but um, yeah, I think that the one thing that concerns me with Vegas and it's popped up for them in the playoffs is they, they don't always score enough when the games get really tight. Um, you know, Colorado, that isn't an issue. Obviously they got some, some real game breaking talent. I think they, they got stronger in a lot of ways over the off season, even while losing Philip Grubauer into free agency to Seattle. Um, and so I, I think the avalanche finally get it done. We'll give Nathan McKinnon the Conn Smythe trophy. Maybe he's getting a heart trophy. Maybe he's getting a scoring title. Maybe he's going to play. Well, he's definitely going to play at the Olympics. Maybe he gets a gold medal. I mean, I, this could be this could be the year of Nathan McKinnon. So um, that that's where I'm I'm putting my bet. What about you? I'm going to say the Colorado Avalanche are going to defeat the New York Islanders in seven games in the Stanley Cup final. I think the Islanders are going to finally break through that ceiling and make it to the final, and they're built to to go through. But I think Colorado, with the amount of talent that they have. And I think what they learned from the Vegas series, the, yeah, I think this has to depend on what they've learned from that Vegas series where they essentially got adjusted against and they were shut down. I would hope that if the Colorado Avalanche are going to go far in the playoffs, they will know how to play against teams like that. And I understand the Islanders are a lot better defensively, but if they're able to crack the code on Vegas, I think with the overwhelming swarm of talent that they have, that might be able to help them out in the playoffs. So I see them going to the final against the New York Islanders, a team who I think might have could make easily make a case beyond Tampa Bay of being the most playoff ready team of anyone in the Eastern Conference. So I'm getting Colorado, New York Islanders in seven games. Colorado will win 
Nathan McKinnon will win the uh, the Conn Smythe Trophy. This is going to be the year of Nathan McKinnon. And if it's not, well, ah, geez, I don't know what I don't know what else it could actually be the year for Nathan McKinnon. This has to be it for the Colorado Avalanche, as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. Now, NHL, go start playing some games and prove us wrong, because I know that yeah. that's, that's that's the next shoe to drop from this conversation. Yes, exactly. But hey, I thought this was still fun regardless. We were able to kind of, you know, stretch our brains a little bit of what we, about what we think might happen in the National Hockey League. And uh, obviously with the news about Carey Price uh, being away from the team, that might change a few things. And even for you listening at home or watching at home about how you view the Canadians and even the Atlantic Division as a whole. But in any case, we could all watch the games together. We could all be wrong together. It's supposed to be a fun thing, people. I'm, I'm pumped for this season, too. I think it's going to be a fun year in the NHL. Kind of more back to normal. Everything coming to life with fans in the building. I think I think that this 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 is a year that holds a lot of promise around the league. I think so as well. CJ, always a pleasure to do these episodes with you on the Chris Johnston show. Uh, again, subscribe to the YouTube channel, the SDPN YouTube channel for more of our videos and also videos for the Steve Dangle podcast as well. And for our podcast, subscribe on Apple, subscribe on Spotify, Google Podcasts, uh, wherever you get podcasts, essentially, we should be there. Uh, I don't, we don't have any merch yet, but hey, maybe if we talk to Jesse about getting CJ Show merch, maybe we can make something work on that. I would like CJ Show merch. I, I think it'd be pretty cool. I don't know. what. How do you feel about people wearing a hat with your face on it? I don't. I feel like we might make it and no one would buy it other than my dad. I think my dad would be like in there just like <laughs> spending all those all his dollars on that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, whatever. I'm, I'm embracing a new world. So whatever, whatever's out there, Julian, let's do it. Let's go for it. For CJ, I'm Julian Singh. So long. We'll be back on Monday with a brand new episode of The Chris Johnston Show. So long, guys. Peace. Bye. The Chris Johnston Show. Inside the game, twice a week. Follow Chris on Twitter at ReporterChris. And follow Julian McKenzie at JKMcKenzie.